I think we've gone a little bit to a world where software change is defined as a field, uh, whereas a field is a result of a business process. So they need to describe the whole business process associated of what the field result is for. And the challenge I guess we've had over the past few things on um, these things, uh, is tell us what problem you're trying to solve and we'll help you solve it rather than tell us how you're solving something but you don't tell us what the problem is you're solving. Because quite often, when they actually explain to us what the problem is, we we'll say, well, you don't need that, you need this. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast, the show that explores the latest insights and innovations in the world of payroll. Today's episode of the Payroll Podcast is sponsored by Deal. Now take a moment to consider the following pre-show scenario. Imagine you had to visit six different houses just to cook your dinner. One place has the pots and the pans, another has the stove, another has the food. You get the idea. Sounds ridiculous, right? Well, the reality is most global businesses operate exactly the same way, using six different tools and platforms just to play their global workforce. But now there's one platform offering truly simple, truly global payroll, and that's today's sponsor. That's Deal. That's D-E-E-L. And Deal's fully managed global payroll makes it possible to pay your entire team in over 100 countries and in over 200 currencies, all in one place. So whether you're an enterprise company, a small business, or something in between, Deal is built to meet your unique business needs. With in-house customer success managers, local payroll experts, and more, Deal's fully managed global payroll eliminates third-party handovers and instead provides unmatched compliance and flexibility. In fact, they'll even help you track and flag the latest changes in payroll regulations before they even become an issue. And with 24-7 monitoring and best-in-class security protocols, your sensitive data is always protected. So are you ready to change your global payroll system? If you are, click the link in the show notes to book your demo with Deal today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to June's edition of Payroll Question Time. My name is Nick Day, and I'm here to guide you all and our expert panel, of course, through the latest significance and development, well, significant developments, rather, in the payroll sector. Of course, we're going to be discovering and discussing the general election, which, as we all know by now, is going to be held on the 4th of July. However, as much as we will try and predict the impact this may have on the world of payroll, I want to reiterate to everybody that this is a politically neutral show. So if you want that political debate, you probably need to go somewhere else. But to hear we're all about giving the payroll advice, talking about the potential changes going to impact your payroll department. Let's talk about some of the things then, because HMRC have made several updates in the past month. So our panel are here today to help you navigate these key changes Uh, I saw as well just this morning some new research from the Global Payroll Association revealing that the HMRC has reduced its core workforce by 3.8% in the past year. But this staff cut has actually led to reliance on overtime, so the wage bill has actually increased by 5.5 million. I think it just goes to show that less doesn't always mean more. Uh, We will, of course, be discussing then and now later on in the show, and we're going to be introducing a new repair shop. A great opportunity where you can ask our panel questions that you need your answers to, and we'll be doing that live. So without further ado, let's dive into the world of payroll with today's edition of Payroll Question Time. Right, let's talk about today's discussion topics then. We've got a lot to get through today. Of course, we're going to start with the general election. We're going to talk about predictions, politics, and employment rights uh, without really getting into the political bit because, of course, we are a neutral show. Um, but we're going to go on then to the repair shop. So what needs overhauls and tweaks? Our RTI wish list and what would you like to see fixed? I'm hoping we'll get a lot of your participation in that section. If you want to get your questions in early, please do so. I'll make sure they go to the top of the list. We're going to look at new breed salary sacrifice and other schemes on the fringe, the future of Nick's. Confusing the burden, hours, postcodes, net pay deductions, small employers discussed as well. A nice section called Stranger Things. So I'll uh, look forward to that. Payroll ID, P2, P6, tax code changes and more. Uh, a then and now, a section we tried to get into the last session, but we simply ran out of time. But we're going to be talking about fractional workers to Bitcoin and how relevant were those predictions for our industry? And perhaps what are the what are predictions that we, we think are still going to come into the future as well? And of course, we'll also bring you the latest from the SD Works Academy and any additional hot topics. So the uh, the words on everyone's lips, let's jump into this. The general election and the road ahead. Predictions, uh, employment rights discussed. Let me start with you, Simon. One of you can take the floor. Yeah, sure, mate. 
Well, I think we we had a little bit of a discussion beforehand. I think we're all pretty bored of it, to be honest, is the reality of the general election. Maybe that's a general uh, thing of the country. But, uh, but there are interesting promises being made around why the various parties are significantly the areas that may be of interest to us in the payroll world, or certainly human resource management, are some of the uh, statements being made on employment rights. So um, you remember back in, I believe it was Theresa May's days, uh, we had the moving forward of the Matthew Taylor review and uh, the proposal to introduce a single enforcer, which we then was interrupted by Brexit and COVID-19 and has sort of gone to one side. So a lot of Matthew Taylor's proposals went ahead, but so far the means of redress by employees on most matters is to take your employer to an employment tribunal. Uh, uh, with the, the only single enforcer on things like gang masters, national minimum wage and a few other types of fringe areas. But the general principles of employment rights are still not governed or policed by anybody. But that's been a hot topic in some of the party um, manifestos on progressing, certainly the Labour uh, Party in putting forward the single enforcer proposal. That's the sort of initial thing that comes in. You're going to have some that are going to put down national insurance, others are going to put up national insurance and others will keep national insurance. And and so there are various uh, things around tax will go up, tax will go down, tax will stay the same. We're all going to get taxed. Um, there are my initial thoughts, Nick. Um, uh, some, at some point, someone's got to pay for something, I guess, although taxation levels are meant to be in the highest for some significant time. But it was good to see inflation down 2%. Absolutely. Karen, anything you'd like to add? Um, along similar lines, you know, that the, I say being politically neutral um, around the employment law side, there's things that there's certain parties, so Labour certainly is one the zero hours, but I think Lib Dems also agree, Green Party, so there's not just one party. Um, zero hours, they don't like that concept, they want that to go. Uh, employment rights, so unfair dismissal, for example, is it's two years, they're looking to make that a day one right. Um, and this isn't just a single part, Labour being the, the main party, I suppose, in opposition, but others are along the same lines. As Simon says, with national insurance, um, the Tories will make it go even lower. Are there one question how they're going to pay for pensions and the NHS and everything else that supposedly comes out of that not tax national insurance social security contribution. Um, Labour, of course, have said not they've been quite, quite silent on it. Lib Dems, I think, are the ones that said they would increase it for those over fifty thousand pounds or something like that, and it would go up in increments. But I think the one I'm watching the most is around pensions, um, in the fact that. Again, it's to do with tax. And if anybody saw the debate last night, again, staying politically neutral, I'm not sure we learnt anything uh, at the end of that debate, other than the public really aren't impressed with the two uh, possible prime ministers there. Um, but with the, the pensions, so you've got the first one with the state pensions. So Conservatives saying they would do pensions, the triple lock plus. And all that means is that effectively as they will increase the personal allowance for those on state pension so they don't pay tax. Now, one of the things called me sceptic there, one of the good reasons for them doing that, of course, is the DWP doesn't run a payroll for state pensions. So if it goes above that tax allowance, one could argue that DWP would suddenly have to start running payroll in order to deduct tax where somebody only has a state pension. But there may be a very good reason looking after pensioners at the same time. Um, the other one, uh, now Labour wouldn't commit to the triple lot plus but they do seem to be sitting on the, they keep it as is for the triple lock. But the other part of it is around the tax-free lump sum, 25% that you get tax-free lump sum on pensions. And just earlier on today, I was looking at sort of, I do say as well, again, a caveat, lots of the papers, that depends on which political party they support and which ones they don't, so bearing that in mind. Um, they were saying that the shadow um, pensions minister would not answer whether or not they would look to remove that 25% or reduce that 25%. So she wouldn't commit to whether or not there would be changes to taxes on the pensions, um, i.e. things like the lump sum. So that's a space I think we need to watch. So there was no answer given. So that just might mean that the lady didn't know what it was. 
um, as we were talking about before, or um, they've not thought of it, or it's just missing from a manifesto, or it's not there. So there's quite a lot to be, I think what will happen though, is whoever gets in, particularly if it changes colour, there will be an awful lot of things to be going on in the first 100 days to be watching. So I feel very sorry for Matthew, uh, but very pleased that I'm no longer policy at the CIPP. <laughs> you know, you've done my job for me. It's a great segue. So Matthew, obviously your role is entrenched in research and being prepared for all potential outcomes and how that may impact policy. So, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts here? What, what can you bring to the, uh, the table to help our, listen, uh, our listeners and viewers? Yeah, so uh, as I said, trying to be politically neutral, but if we're to sort of believe the polling, um, it's becoming increasingly likely that we we will see a Labour government. So quite rightly, that's sort of where we've been sort of looking at the the legislative plans that they want to bring in. And as Karen said, you've got some interesting things happen with pensions. Um, you know, not not committing to a triple lock plus, but their their manifesto states that they don't want to raise the headline rates of income tax or national insurance, but doesn't necessarily say anything about the thresholds, which leaves a little bit of an avenue there for, for sort of making some changes. With the pensions, though, what I'm sort of uh, quite interested in, they said they want to adopt some workplace pension reforms, but didn't necessarily dive into what those were. Now, in 2023, so last year, we had um, a private member's bill reach royal assent, which basically they were seeking to extend auto enrolment to those aged 18 and up and uh, remove uh, the uh, qualifying earnings lower threshold, uh, which potentially could bring a lot more people into auto enrolment and contributing a lot more from earlier in their, in their paycheck. But when you combine that with something like their commitment to uh, ask the low pay commission to consider the cost of living in national minimum wage calculations and to remove the national minimum wage age bands, depending on when then these things come in, could potentially pose a huge cost on businesses that have a significant young workforce. Uh, so it's things like this that kind of when we've got the noise of all these different policy ideas sort of floating around there's those sort of things i think it's important for businesses to sort of consider with their budgeting and financial planning because the combination of a few of these things happening at the same time could mean huge changes and you know that's on top of all of the uh the sort of uh employment law stuff that they're seeking to do day one uh, sick pay protection from unfair dismissal and parental leave you know some of these things don't necessarily have a financial impact on a business but could have an impact on sort of staffing and resource that knock on could have financial impact so i think there's uh, like karen said in like those first hundred days will be very telling what they want to focus on to bring in as soon as possible but it could mean huge sort of changes to the sort of employment and running a business landscape. Yeah, fantastic. I think uh, to add very little to the conversation, but I'll give a different observation. For anyone who watches the uh, the Traitors uh, series two at the moment, we've got John Burko <laughs> in the room. And my question is, will he be in or out before the 4th of July? It's a fascinating watch. Yeah, it's of course a House of Commons speaker suddenly, suddenly found himself in the in traitors series two the us version and it's quite a watch seeing such a political celebrity <laughs> shall we say against all these reality tv stars anyway i definitely bring the tone of the show down let's um <laughs> let's jump into some of the uh the questions we've got here before we jump into this rti wish list we've had a couple of questions come in and please if you're watching this at the minute and you've got anything that you want to talk about and bring into the repair shop things that you perhaps feel does need an overhaul perhaps it does need a tweak perhaps you'd like to see uh, as a result of the general election, irrespective of who gets in, what would you like to see changed? What are what are some of the uh, the policies that you are particularly you know, in favour of, perhaps? Do share them in our comments or in our questions box. But a couple of questions that have come in. First comes in from Sarah. It says, potentially from the 6th of April 2025, employers will be required to report the total number of hours worked by each employee in respect of payments reported in the relevant RTI return. Please confirm if there is any guidance on this. Is it actually happening? I'm going to come to you with this one, Matthew, because you are shaking your head. I wonder if you could answer the question for us. Um, so realistically, what we have received from HMRC is we want to make sure you report your hours worked. And beyond that, we have had very little actual information. 
Um, we've had the initial consultation on it, improving the data that HMRC collects, where they've sort of set out their general reasoning. I don't want to say reasoning, but there's a somewhat of a thought process around it. Um, but beyond why they want to do it and what they want to do, there's no guidance yet. So essentially, we were hoping for something on that relatively soon. Uh, I'm alive on a webinar. <laughs> say that? Say again? No. no sorry. Oh, <laughs> not was that not for me? <laughs> um, sorry. Um, but we were hoping for something relatively soon, but with the pre-election period, HMRC, understandably, well, they have to go very quiet about any new announcements. So any new sort of information on that hasn't been forthcoming in the past sort of five weeks. Um, when we get the results of the election, whatever government is formed will potentially take a view on whether they proceed with this. Because to be honest, we're still relatively early within the within the plan cycle of how these things get implemented. There's still a lot of scope for things to be changed and moved around. So that would be a decision that future ministers may make that they want to continue with it, make it expand the scope, constrict the scope we'll we'll have to wait and see so simple answer no we don't have any information on that but keep tuned fair enough anything you'd like to add karen i'll come to you first and then maybe simon just the same as matthew sorry it was something on my computer that started to play that i did quickly shut down so apologies matthew for it coming over with this um and to everybody else um no, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the hours, it's rather strange because there was an awful lot. It was brought out. We made quite a lot of noise in the industry about what it is, why did they want it, which we still don't have any answers for. I can only think that it's due to PERDA that we've not heard anything else, which makes me think it wasn't cross party um, why they wanted something. I don't know. Uh, perhaps the reason for which they never shared that they did what the information might change depending on the election outcome. Um, I don't know, but um, we've got nothing more yet. But it'll be interesting if they still want this in for 2025. Um, I would be highly surprised if there's no pushback on 2025, because given we are in June, it's going to be at least until after the election before anything is said. The software to make changes and not just the software, the software bit, forgive me, Simon, is because obviously it still needs rules and whatever else. But to actually as a as a bureau, you know, anybody that's particularly a service provider trying to get this information from clients will be extremely time consuming and indeed difficult and even sometimes impossible. Um, so, you know, be where does the obligation lie and whatever else. So there's an awful lot more to it. So watch this space. Yeah, we um, we sort of in our consultation response, just to sort of jump back in on that, really recommended that it was rethought whether this was brought in for 2025, just because of the time it's going to take to test and get the processes and systems up in place. And um, so we would be surprised if it was still 2025, but you never know. Well, there's now, no indication you... yet that it isn't is there which is the other thing and so i guess we're you, you know you could say uh, matthew and i have gone a bit quiet on our social media type a uh, little bit because there is nothing because the government have shut up uh, and not saying anything we we can find some bits around but on this um the proposals that have come and they've come through generally with very solid suggestions that Karen and I and, and probably Matthew have been involved in, in some of the consultation meetings but they at the moment they come across a little bit um, I'm trying to be uh, fairly neutral um, uh, ridiculous is the word that comes to mind I'm afraid uh, so um, what what ours and so they've tried to give some examples they're clearly nonsense the examples that they give because they don't necessarily associate with worked hours at all uh, um, for when you're off sick and other times or do overtime so it's 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 sort of are they making up the answers on the spot when you ask them the question it's just a little bit of the feeling um the, the other aspect is they've come out with well all you've got to do is select a reason for not giving an answer off your screen and there's element of when, when you're paying 150,000 people 
I don't think people are going to be selecting a reason for not reporting the right hours. So they came up with a table, um, I'm going to say, of about a dozen items that you'd have to select and say why you couldn't provide the hours. And it's sort of, are you really going to do that? And I, I don't know, um, that message was repeated to them a number of times. I wasn't ever sure if they were getting it. Uh, and so, but we'll have to see. But as far as software change, uh, if the two RTI fields are introduced, one with a value that replaces the current hours banding with an hours value, uh, that's very easy for software to introduce, assuming that that's released in the specification for August, September at time, which is when RTI specs are normally issued. The other aspect of can we put a reason code on the RTI file? Um, as a field, as a letters A to H or whatever. Uh, yes, that's relatively easy as well. So the software part is easy, I think, as you were hint hinting, Karen. The difficulty is, where do the values come from? And that's not so easy, because I can give you an ability to define where those hours values are to come from, but you have to configure it. What hours is it? Does that include sickness? Does that take out holiday? What happens if they've done it? There's all sorts of things. Uh, and lots of people, even though they're hourly paid, many payroll don't really receive the hours, they receive the cash. So there's an element of, there may be an element of thinking that business needs to get ready to present an hours value. Now that was brought in just before COVID hit that you had to produce a value in relation to variable hours on the pay slip. And that may be part of it or may not be, but this would have been all hours, uh, not just variable hours potentially to be there. But if you didn't have a reason for giving all of them, uh, you're really going to code in that live each period for your thousands of employees. It was sort of, this is just crazy, was the initial. Um, um, uh, I'm just fearful that um, my responses to them in some of the meetings, Karen, may have come across um, very clearly um, that I thought that it was all a bit silly. Um, and how are we going to do this? But from a software point of view, can we be ready for hours in April 2025? Absolutely. From a business point of view and a payroll management and uh, uh, your employees, Will you have the data to pass to the software? I'm much more doubtful because you won't know what to collect and what it's for. And that's the challenge. Yeah. I think I we've answered. Agree, Simon, you've, you've made it very, very clear to HLC, for which I would say that we've all mirrored those very same views. Fantastic. Well, I think it's we've all probably answered the next question I've had come in as well, which just says, in terms of RTI, I think I've heard plans to include reporting actual working hours as part of the process. Have you heard anything about this? I think we've probably covered that there. But there's another question that's come in. Rolled up holiday pay, what constitutes regular overtime? Um, well, yeah, in regards to rolled up holiday pay, uh, overtime has no consequence at all because rolled up holiday pay has to be paid on top of all pay. So regular or irregular has no bearing. If you pay someone money, you have to pay the 1207% on top regardless. But that's only for irregular hours workers and part workers. A part year worker is someone who's contracted for longer than they're paid for. So it isn't just someone who's got a six month job. It's someone who's got a, a job for a period of time where they have weeks within the contract terms where they won't be paid. An irregular hours worker is someone who doesn't really have any contract hours and or it varies or is casual in nature. So generally for those others, it would fall under the uh, standard um, average holiday pay 52 weeks over the last 104, excluding zero pay weeks. 
And uh, I always think it's a little bit confusing sometimes with the DBT information on what does regular mean. Some will interpret it as regular means if it's payable under the contract. And that was certainly the judgment under the East Anglia ambulance uh, sort of um, case. And others would say regular means it has some sort of timing regularity. But the law doesn't really explain what some of its words mean. So generally, if you're due to pay overtime, in the contract, in other words, I worked an hour's extra, so you owe me an hour's pay. I'd say that's in, I'll say that as a view, that becomes regular. Um, if it's um, uh, other people, uh, like I'd imagine some of us here, probably work over our standard hours. And uh, if we get overtime, it's probably a miracle or, um, <laughs> or unusual. Um, but occasionally, uh, for example, I know there have been some instances over the past few years where we've needed to bring in extra people in to cover certain activity where they did actually pay overtime, whereas normally you wouldn't receive it because you're at that sort of management or seniority grade. Does that help Super. a little bit? But uh, I think Matthew, that's a you may have a view on response. regular. Yeah, I I would sort of mirror what what you'd said there, and like you said, the law doesn't necessarily give you a specific answer. Um, many companies take the view of I'm going to include it as a just in case, go to the sort of nth degree, and you're never going to fall short of it. Um, and th this may be a bit glib, but sometimes I say to people, you don't need to convince me, you don't need to convince HMRC, but you might need to convince someone in a tribunal or a court of law. And if you feel you can you can defend that, then great. But if you feel like you might not have a chance of defending that, then you probably uh, probably err on the side of caution. Um, but yeah, it, usually it is a business decision, but until someone wants to uh, argue that with you, it might not come up, but it's up to you as to what your risk appetite is. Yeah, I guess okay. another comment there, Nick, is that uh, it, holiday law has got a lot of subjectivity to it. It's interpretive. And, and us as peril people are used to certainty, aren't we? Because tax is uh, this amount or it's not. Whereas holiday law is um, a little bit, up, bit like an accountant asking a business how much profit they want to make because they can uh, change the books around to meet whatever profit level is required within certain boundaries. And holiday is a bit like that. So you could have um, a, a common comment made to us is, of course, you must do this for others. It's all the same, isn't it? The reality on holiday law is that no two employers may actually implement it exactly the same. They could each do a slightly different thing. Uh, some of them will be wrong. And some of them will be right, or many of them will be right. It's not set in such black and white um, uh, terms as what is right and wrong. The other interesting thing, though, and I think that goes with the Labour Party proposal, is um, holiday law, even though it's very open to lots of interpretation, uh, would become part of the single enforcer coverage. So at the moment, we've got this sort of element of protection to the extent that an employee would have to take us to court. Uh, in the future, uh, an employee will probably get to a point where they only have to complain. And the reality is that employee's holiday pay may be right. But as we know with national minimum wage, the national minimum wage doesn't catch the one that complains where actually the minimum wage was right, it catches all the others that didn't complain where the minimum pay was wrong, even if those employees were happy to have entered arrangements that might uh, cause their pay to drop below it and wouldn't have taken the employer to court. So it becomes a very different world. Super. Well, we've got our poll coming up. I don't want to get there quite yet. I'm going to put you on the hot seat here, Matthew. We've got our repair shop here. I'm going to ask you, uh, what do you think needs an overhaul? What would you tweak in a perfect world? And in terms of RTI, what would you like to see fixed? So I think the, the overhaul for me is RTI um, in that it's it's a very one directional conversation. Um, you know, businesses provide HMRC with with their data. Uh, as they sort of are legally bound to do, and that's fine. And for the most part, it works. For the most part, you send over your returns, you, you pay what you need to pay, and everything chugs along fine. Um, 
But I feel increasingly we're seeing, and I'm certainly getting members come to me complaining of, of this, when things do go wrong, it's very difficult to get those sort of things rectified. Um, now, I understand that there's more techie stuff happening in the background than just fixing some numbers. You know, it's it's likely a huge database that you can't just allow anyone on HMRC's helplines to start fiddling around with. Um, but I definitely think there needs to be more of a mechanism to allow employers to more easily interact and amend figures where things have gone wrong, particularly where they're sort of potentially impacting employees' tax codes and actually causing financial I say financial harm. But if it's impacting their take home pay, then, yeah, that could constitute financial harm to some individuals. And I think that's. Uh, Something that, that needs addressing. The scope of that problem, I'm not entirely sure, but um, I think a, an RTI system that works both ways would be would be beneficial. Super. I'm going to come to you, Karen. The repair shop, what do you think needs an overhaul? What would you tweak and what would you like to see fixed? Um, overhaul for me would be if salary sacrifice is to continue, that we overhaul it with the national minimum wage. Um, the number of employees that are missing out, whether it's be to pensions, whether it be for, um, you know, cycle to work schemes, whatever it is, I'm just seeing the volume of employees having to be taken out of the salary sacrifice scheme because of national minimum wage. And, you know, as we've already heard, you know, all parties are going to be looking to increase that national minimum wage level. So what level will depend on the party who gets in? But they're all going to be looking to do that. So that's going to take even more people out. Now, if there is this appetite that they don't want salary sacrifice anymore, then just, just get rid of it. Just be done with it. Um, whilst it would obviously people like myself who salary sacrifice, you would, you know, lose out those tax. But, you know, it's one or the other. But I think give people that choice. And it must be choice. They've managed it with automatic enrolment. I'm sure they can manage it with national minimum wage and salary sacrifice. So that would be my overhaul. Um, for RTI, I would like to see a review of what we submit, why we submit. So as Simon mentioned before, at the moment, we have a band for those hours. Actually, it's irrelevant now because that was for working tax credits, which doesn't exist. We have universal credits now. So actually, that should have just gone, not be tweaked, not be added to with this burdensome possible collection of hours. And I'll stop there because that's one of my high horse moments. Um, but the other thing I'd like to see with RTI is real time, both ways. And I don't just be so because at the moment we submit in real time. And so many for, for service providers in particular, clients and indeed employees think it is real time. And it isn't. Um, we submit on or before payday, but it doesn't then show up because I'd also like to see that link, not only for the employer, so that you can see employer portals or the client portals if you're a service provider, but also the personal tax account, because quite often that is uh, that is that's not matching what's been submitted. Now, that could be a time lag. That could be that there was an error somewhere in HMLC systems because they're not linked to my knowledge now, PTAs on so personal tax accounts are not linked to the RTI submission. The RTI goes into the HMLC, nice big pot, and from there, data goes to the personal tax account. And there's a mismatch. And that causes problems when, particularly as we're pushing more and more and more employees to the personal tax account. I've experienced it myself, where I've looked at the personal tax account. And then on that, whilst it's connected, is then having the ability to tell HMRC as an individual taxpayer. So that, again, will reduce the burdens with, with employers to be able to tell HMRC that something has changed. You can do a little bit now. You can say, you know, you want to claim home working or whatever it might be. Uh, you can also say you've estimated my earnings incorrectly. Um, you know, that sort of hits particularly around P11D time and bonuses and things like that. But otherwise, there's very little that you can do that says, I don't think this is quite right. Or you've got this, but it's not there. So that would be my repair shop come wish list combined. No, great response. Day, Enjoy both, friend, of them. But I won't. both of them so far. No, this is good. Um, I'm almost frightened to ask Simon the same question. But the good thing is you all come from very different perspectives, of course. You've got bureau and management perspective, policy perspective, <laughs> software perspective. Maybe, Simon, let me come to you. Sure. Same question. 
Yeah, sure. I think the repair shop analogy is a really good one because when you see those items taken into the repair shop, that team of specialists, in effect, deconstruct the whole thing and strip it apart and then rebuild it, having to replace parts. And actually, the, the challenge with um, when RTI works, it works well. When it doesn't work, which is in 2% of employer cases, according to statistics, which is tens of thousands of employers, uh, generally that probably be more towards the larger ones, so not the tiddlers, although it will affect some of the tiddlers as well. Um, it really goes wrong and it's a real um, repair shop, you know, break down, undo, locate. The problem is the, the angle for it. I mean, some of us here are specialists in repair shop type activity for payroll. The challenge sometimes is you are totally blind to the item you're trying to repair. So you've got some uh, external evidence, but you really don't know what's inside uh, because you don't have an HMRC view. And so there'd be, uh, I think that's probably Matthew's point, much more open information so that we know exactly what HMRC hold. So what's the point in telling someone to do an EYU haven't existed since 2020, by the way, they don't exist, they've disappeared. What's the point of telling someone to do an EYU to correct a misbalance on a PAYE count when they can't even tell you who it relates to because an EYU relates to a person, not an employer. The other thing is get rid of the EPS. That's always been my uh, campaign. Carol will know from the past is EPS, complete waste of time. So I tell you who I've paid S&P and separately I have to claim it back. How ridiculous can that be? So there's elements of get rid of the EPS, but then I go into other things. There's an element of other things that are broken, Nick, that still cause problems. And some of it, I think, is we're, we're called customers these days, but we're not really a customer. Uh, Karen, you probably know what I'm talking about. But the terminology used in exchange isn't from the view of the customer. So if you really want to treat it as customers, talk to us in customers and not code and an area uh, particular where that's a problem is tax reliefs on pensions so start calling them what they are you know relief before or relief after tax not net pay which is the opposite and relief at source which is the opposite of what we actually think it means in our head so the default position of someone who's a novice going in saying oh this is this will apply the wrong way round. And you see it so often. So there's an element of look at the language and let's change it so that you talk from the perspective of the customer, if we really are customers, rather than code language that everybody uses. I mean, obscure minds like Karen, uh, Matthew and mine, all a bit odd. Well, I am, uh, as you know, but the ordinary person, they're just nonsense uh, discussion. And then uh, there's an element of the thing that I see often, I guess you could say it's slightly RTI. I'm seeing so many employers pulled up in audits to explain values of field 58A, 58B, 59. What on earth for? They were all Bax hash values and the Bax hash went two years ago. So why are you quizzing their value? And I think HMRC are placing an interpretation on the content of what those fields should be that's not in their descriptions. That doesn't say what they are. And those fields could actually be anything. And uh, deduction, calling something deduction from net pay, uh, it reminds me of the old Brian Charmley that we used to meet, uh, know of uh, uh, Karen from years ago, of saying he could do a, he provide a 20 page thesis explaining the differences in meaning for the words net pay because they can mean all sorts of things. And, uh, and I think that's the reality. So, why? audit, large business audits occurring on those fields. I've got no idea because uh, payment for non-taxable, non-eniable could be anything. 
could be expenses, could be a share scheme notional amount, it could be a salary sacrifice notional value, it could be a pension AE notional value, it could be anything put into the payroll so solution to aid any calculation that's marked as non-taxable, non-enable that's gone there. And then deductions from net pay. It, deductions from net pay could be anything. Why have I got to explain that to you? I've told you what the tax gross is. I've told you what the tax is, etc. So there's those sorts of things increasingly, uh, which confuse me, Nick, because they haven't got enough time uh, to do a lot of stuff. So why are they spending so much time doing nonsense? Sorry, uh, is that coming across a bit critical there? Well, I'm very glad I asked the question. That was Sorry. very entertaining. It comes to you, Matthew. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Sure. Like, just discussing this, we we're obviously talking about the changes that we'd make to RTI. And, you know, we're seeing the introduction of the hours worked and it's small tweaks that are happening over long periods of time. Is the RTI process too big and too complicated to reform? Is it now too big to mess around with, do you think? Yeah, well, if you're asking that as a question to me, Matthew, I, I don't know that it is. I think uh, it is now 11 years old. So there is an element is the technology rights. And we have seen HMRC push a number of things into RTI XML messages where you think they'd be better placed on the employer PAYE online account, wouldn't they? Just as an option, why, why would you have an e, for example, the EPS sent via XML exchange uh, when uh, I, as an employer, can just go on and tell you what the value is online? I'll is do it, it for other stuff. I was going to just come in there as well, given what Simon was saying to do with investigating what's the subject to tax and NICs and whatever else, and then these collection of hours. And forgive me because I am a critical friend of HRC uh, on the whole. Um, but there is just always so every so often these little niggles that I don't like. Um, and something that reminds me when you're looking at all these bits and pieces is centralised deductions, which Simon, you will definitely remember, and I'm sure Matthew, you will have I heard do. of, is that this was where, if you remember, HMLC were looking at using Vocalink as it was at the time, so the BAX provider, where we would have provided gross information but we would have told them what was taxable and nickable somehow and then HMLC through Vocalink through the banking system were going to determine net pay take the tax and any deductions that were due to the treasury HMLC and then pop into the bank account the net pay and that's it in a nutshell obviously it was much bigger than that but that's it in a nutshell and it's just when you start hearing these little pieces and tweaks that they're doing is that what they're trying to find out? Are they trying to find out hours that can, are they trying to see if there is an alternative to RTI? Coming back to your question, Matthew, is it too big? Is it time for an overhaul? Is it time for tweaks? Or are they doing some exploration to see what that is? Or was another solution of, of potential? Coming uh, from my side of the lens, Matthew, do they just not have the resources? As the research said earlier, they've cut their workforce for another 3.8%. This is going to take manpower. It's going to take human intervention to get it right. And if you're cutting your workforce and overtime is going up and you don't have the budget or the, or the manpower to do what needs to be done, again, it, I'm sure anything is possible in this current world of, of work and with all the innovations that we have, but we've got to have the resources and the time to, to, to dedicate to it. I like the idea of RTI. Most of the time it works out well. It reminded me of the Mike Tyson uh, quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. It's all well and good, right? If it's going well most of the time, it you need it to go well, though, when there's a problem. That's when it really gets exposed, right? And it sounds like there's a lot of tweaks that can be done. I'm aware we've been on this slide for some time. The, uh, our, our audio and, uh, um, and viewers must be keen to see another slide. So let's open up our poll. Let's get them involved. Let's wake them up. Shake yourselves out. First poll of the day is, do you have an RTI challenge? Uh, perhaps it's one of the challenges our uh, fantastic panel just raised, or perhaps it's something else. Four options for you here. The first, for those in audio only, is currently not. The second is yes in the past 12 months. Uh, yes in the past two years, or so many I've lost track. Uh, I think we've got some really interesting challenges raised by our panel just a moment ago, and I suspect Karen, Matthew, and Simon could have spoken about many, many more if I gave them the time to do so. Maybe we'll come back to this in a future PQT. But whatever your uh, thoughts are, put your answers in the box. And in a moment, I'll get uh, maybe Karen, if you can comment on the results when they come through, that'd be wonderful. And in just a moment, we're going to talk about Karen's uh, subject there that she raised a moment ago, salary sacrifice schemes. And next, we're going to talk about the new breed of salary sacrifice and other schemes that are on the fringe 
what's out there, true or false, confusion over vouchers, tax versus national insurance, and the future of NICs as well. So lots still to get through. Let's have a look at some of these poll results if we can. Wait for those to come through. So the results for those in audio only. We have currently not 44%. Yes, in the past 12 months, 36%. This relates to do you have an RTI challenge? Yes, in the past two years, 13%. And so many I've lost track, 8%. I'm going to leave this back to you, Karen. What are your thoughts on those results? Um, well, it's quite pleasing that 44% currently do not have any challenges. So that's really good. But so we are in June now. So we've got through year end. So I think that's a really positive. Um, not surprised by the 36 in the last 12 months. Um, I think we've given all the different things of, you know, whether it be apprenticeship levies, there's been some of that that's been a mismatch. Uh, people claiming the employment allowance when they shouldn't or people who should be and haven't. So adjustments there. Um, so many have lost track. 8% is quite a significant number. Although it's lower than all the rest, it's still 8% just too many. Um, which is unfortunately quite common that if you're particularly if you're a larger employer that you can uh, you know you can you can lose track because there's that many different things that have gone wrong um unfortunately some of those i think will be down to hmrc offering your fix that is the incorrect fix i've still had people in the past from hmrc telling me to you know you need to do an eyu which doesn't even exist and they can sound very surprised when you say that. So there will be employers out there who are applying fixes that actually aren't going to fix it. They'll make it worse. So that might be there. That's my views. Sure. But on the whole, it's really positive. 44% currently not. Well, let's jump in then to our next slide, our next topic for today's PQT, salary sacrifice schemes and next. So I'm going to let me stay with you, Karen, for a minute, just because you brought this up as something that. Um, you were keen to see potentially changed if you had the uh, the opportunity to do so. Well, if you could uh, give us a bit of an introduction uh, to talk us about um, the new breed of salary sacrifice and other schemes on the fringe and more. Hello, HR and people leaders. Are you not exhausted from the endless war for talent battle cries? I think it's time for a fresh approach, which is why at JGA Recruitment, we understand the real challenges you face in sourcing top HR talent. And guess what? We believe we have the solution. Our team is on a mission to revolutionize your hiring process because we're not just recruiters, we're strategic partners dedicated to finding the best HR and people professionals who align perfectly with your company's vision and goals. Let's break the cycle of frustration together, join forces with JJ Recruitment and experience the difference in hiring better talent faster. Don't let another day go by without taking action Contact us today by visiting jgarecruitment.com to discover how we can transform your HR team. And here's a bonus. When you visit us, why not sign up for our weekly HR newsletter? Because it's packed with invaluable industry insights and more. We really hope you can revolutionize your HR department by working with JGA Recruitment. Contact us today. Um, um, uh, this subject has actually come back through a conversation that Simon, myself and Matthew were having last week when we were looking at topics and what have you. Um, and it would be interesting to know if any of your listeners uh, put anything through in the chat around this. I've started to get emails from certain providers of salary sacrifice schemes. Um, whereby they're offering or they're proposing that they can provide salary sacrifice schemes for things that Simon and I are certainly and then looking to Matthew, we're thinking that wouldn't apply. Doesn't so matter. the optional remuneration arrangements Shopping would apply or offer as we know it. Um, you know, we're thinking, well, actually, but the way in which they were being marketed, let's say, clever marketing or incorrect marketing, um, was giving us some concern given that we'd all had these emails thinking that doesn't look quite right, offering, you know, just just sort of tweaking around the edges. And we're not sure if it's a marketing ploy or are there going to be poor employers who get caught out with this, go and do salary sacrifice and then find that it's obviously incorrect, that there are no tax reliefs or they shouldn't be done because opera would in fact apply. So that's just our concerns. But Simon, you probably want to add a bit more because you were delving even more into that. 
Well, yeah, if you're happy if I go there. So, um, yeah, we, we've seen some a there's active companies going around saying you ought to offer these uh, salary sacrifice benefits to your employees. They're obviously recruiting. I mean, to send them to me, it was just a bit of a surprise, but I've received them as well. Um, and uh, one of the schemes that's being offered is uh, salary sacrifice for grocery purchase. And it says that you will save national insurance. The challenge is they provide a voucher, uh, and vouchers are actually subject to class one national insurance. So there is no national insurance savings. So it's a false claim, we suggest, unless they're going to say it magically fits some other means. But uh, a, a non cash voucher for groceries is subject to class one national insurance in payroll. The taxation is generally P11D, or you could payroll it. But the uh, national insurance is real-time payroll requirements. You can't get away with that one. Uh, the other one that seems to be actively being promoted is in relation to workplace place pensions. Not workplace pensions, sorry. Workplace nurseries. Except the nursery doesn't seem to have anything to do with the workplace at all. In fact, it seems quite a long way. And the control and management is there. In fact, HMRC have obviously come across this. They've issued a note, which is on their HMRC sites, uh, warning people about these schemes that they don't work. Now, there may be some fringe bases or, or, or cases where maybe they have been shown to work, but that doesn't mean it will work for someone else. So I think there's an element to be careful. So we're seeing a lot of salary sacrifice schemes being promoted on the basis that they save at least national insurance when they may not. Uh, and that's even the case for uh, tech schemes, I suggest, if a non-cash voucher is issued it would still be subject to class one national insurance. If it's uh, if it's for the tech itself, fine. But if it's for the shop vouchers, it's not fine. So it's just an element of thinking, how are these working? And are we being falling into the trap? Now, the means of getting over salary sacrifice and getting rid of it is to uh, eliminate national insurance, probably, because then there would be no difference between pensions a and pension salary sacrifice b because there would be no national insurance implication uh maybe that's why the government have been reducing it a little bit i don't know but uh but i'm just a bit concerned and i don't know you know matthew you've got a view but there's a number of promoters out there where these don't look like they work oh, well, yeah. before matthew answers that matthew i'm going to mention because i think this will give you some context as yeah, an no employer i I see this a lot, right? Because what they're trying to do in their promotions and probably why you're getting the email, Simon, is they hit the employees, not the business owners with the solution. Uh, and they let the yes. employees come to you saying, why aren't we getting Same. X, Y, and Z? And of course, you then have to explain, as you just have, why they're not as good as they first did. And it does cause a problem as an employer myself. It's, it's one of those things you constantly got to go, well, I've got this email that says I can salary fat sacrifice X, Y, and Z. And each time, if I don't know the answer, I'll obviously go to our payroll provider who, who provides one for us. But very rarely are they quite as glamorous or as easy as they first see and it's you know you constantly kind of have to educate or, or go back and you want to be seen to be doing the right thing we're you know recognized great place to work um with the awards there but we've got to make sure we're doing the right things and it's i think it's a tactic from some of these promotional providers go into the employees and make you go back to the employer uh, but sorry matthew just to give you some context i thought i might help but say uh, i'd love to get your view no no that, that that's great um I mean, with regards to salary sacrifice, to, to clarify, you can salary sacrifice absolutely anything you want, provided that you're not going below national minimum wage. The issue is the next step of what's the taxation method and the national insurance method on the benefit that you've salary sacrificed. Um, <clears throat> so we, we generally understand that you can salary sacrifice into your pension and pension is one of the things that's covered by the optional remuneration arrangement exemptions. Uh, so that's one of the things that they say, you know what, we, we're fine with you saving the tax and saving the ANI on this particular benefit. So you, you salary sacrifice that and you get that full benefit. Other things such as vouchers, such as provision of certain equipment or buying something, you know, you've got um, a whole range of options. Private medical insurance is another thing that's commonly sort of done through salary sacrifice. But you need to make sure that you're equalizing the tax position on that somewhere, whether that's 
as Simon said, through pay rolling, through a P11D. Um, and yeah, I think the, the concerns are that there's there are ways to deliberately obfuscate and confuse people with how these schemes work. And that essentially is where where that sort of business practice lies, that if there's if there's a way to confuse people into doing something that doesn't give them the desired outcome, then then they will do. Um, so it's just a case of making sure that you look at any particular benefit that you want to offer and fully understand what the tax and NI position on that benefit is before you go salary sacrificing, because salary sacrifice is not a magic button to uh, save tax and NI on everything. Uh, it can save tax and NI in certain situations. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, maybe let's, let's go to our second poll. We've got a question to ask our panel while we wait for those poll results to come in. Uh, our next poll of the day is what should the future of NICS look like? And sponsor options for those in audio only are scrap it, keep it, merge with income tax or reduce its scope. Uh, and while we're waiting for those results to come in from those that are watching, uh, perhaps I'll come back to you, Simon, to begin with uh, for all of your views here. But start with you, Simon. What is the future of NICS from your perspective? Well, yeah, it's a difficult one. I think we've kind of lost identity of what it is, but uh, but its original identity was confused anyway. So I guess we were probably under impression after the Second World War and the forties, whatever, going into the fifties, that we would be putting money aside for our future to the extent of if we become unemployed or uh, when we retire, so that we're saving. The reality is no money has been put aside anywhere. It was spent immediately on other people and there was nothing invested for ourselves. So I guess there's an element of moving from that point of view of thinking there was money put aside for our future to actually uh, we were just putting a promise aside to then take that out of future people's payments of um, what recently has been referred to as a tax uh, rather than a national insurance or social insurance as it may be called elsewhere. So there's an element of thinking, uh, is the attitude changing? And equally, uh, we've got a recent government who are treating it as a double taxation event because other people who do have taxable income don't pay it, yet they still benefit from those other items. So I think we've gone from uh, a clear understanding of potentially what its intention was to a confused state of thinking it's just another tax, so just merge it. It's very strange. Uh, I think a lot of things, our understandings have been uh, confused over these past few years. Mm. And uh, any, any further thoughts? So I'm going to come to, to you, Karen, on, on what you think future from your perspective? Well, I mean, I agree with everything Simon said. I mean, I remember uh, when David Gork was the financial secretary to the Treasury and the merging or the alignment, I think it was called, of national insurance and income tax was was posed and they looked at it. And um, in the end, the I'm not sure there was enough buy-in, but also the difficulties around unpicking or getting rid of the Social Security Act, which is where Simon's coming in of what it was the original intention was. But uh, I think, and this is a personal view, um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, if you've, if you've got the Conservatives reducing the, the national insurance, and they obviously think they can do that. And whoever checks all these numbers, um, is it great because it's not being used as we once thought it was being used for? So you wonder, well, why not just make it income tax? Um, you've then got things like, you know, there's an awful lot around the social care agenda across all the parties. Uh, we know that the social care levy went down like a lead balloon. Um, so if you got rid of national insurance, would they look to replace it with something like that? Would it be ring fenced? I mean, I think it was Gordon Brown who said the first started as 1% over the, the higher threshold, the top threshold, and then it became 2% that was ring fenced for the NHS. I'd love to look at the books and see how much was collected in that 2% bracket and to see that it actually went to the NHS. And I, I would imagine it didn't. Um, it just became merged all as one. Um, so I think getting rid of it, having a tax system, page when works on the whole, um, might be a good idea. 
So we put, and then instead of asking you the question, Matthew, I'm going to ask you to comment on the results, which have actually just ever so slightly changed as I, I said that question. So let's get the results on the screen. Um, the results are as they come through. So Karen convincing were, people last minute. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> change slightly from 66% uh, merged with income tax and 8% reduced its scope to 65 and 9. Let's go through. So scrap it uh, for those in audio only. It says 9%. Keep it is 17%. Merge with income tax, 65%. That just dropped at the last minute. And reduce its scope, which increased from uh, uh, up to uh, 9% as it is now. But I'd love to get your thoughts on these, Matthew. So uh, my, my thoughts really is that scrap it and merge it with income tax are really the same answer, to be, to be honest, because at the end of the day, if you're thinking economy wise politically the money's got to come from somewhere um so really both of those are, are the same sort of answer in my eyes and i can certainly see the the pull of that for the average person for for everyone just earning the money and uh, not having to deal with the tax system in the background it really makes little to no difference how that money is taken from you um the the challenges in the background is that the tax system is incredibly complex in this country. Maybe not the most complex in the world, but generally considered to be fairly complex. And removing national insurance contributions could actually be a great way of simplifying our tax system. Uh, now, there's obviously answers that need to be or questions that need to be answered before doing that. How are you going to sort of do certain assessments like eligi eligibility for state pension? Um, we've still got links in with the national insurance system to whether you're eligible for statutory payments, um, but potentially looking at manifestos and trying to sort of introduce uh, day one rights to those sort of things and maybe even remove those um, like lower earnings limits thresholds could simplify things and get us a little bit further down the road to getting rid of national insurance contributions. So, yeah, I sort of I, I agree with the results. I think there's there's certainly a merit there to getting rid of it um, purely from a sort of policy and uh, tax system perspective. For me, we've got all sorts of things that keep happening with national insurance. It's a huge area that HMRC invests a lot of time and effort into sort of arguing cases in this area, you know, status determinations, um, the whole thing with the sort of mileage allowance payments, if you were on a car allowance that sort of cropped up last year, a lot of really complicated, nitty gritty cases that actually, if we didn't have national insurance contributions, would kind of go away. So I see the pull of it. Great. Well, let's jump into our next slide then. Stranger things are upon us. We want to confuse or confusing the burden, hours, postcodes, net pay deductions, small employers and other stranger things as well. Simon, I'm going to give you the floor. Well, if you could just give us an introduction to this interesting section of the show. Yeah, sure. And I may just comment a little bit more on the national insurance aspect, because, of course, the recent proposals have all been about reducing employee contributions and so eliminating from the employee. So it hasn't eliminated the employer uh, taxation on employment. And so there is an element of where does that go? But uh, we are seeing an increasing number of um, odd things going on. So hence the title of the uh, the uh, element. Another one was actually there's an, a requirement announced for postcodes for the um, uh, investment zones uh, and uh, free ports to be reported. So that's the postcode of the place of that the individual is working that's using those NI category letters. Um, that started out with an earlier proposal of a postcode um, for everyone of place of work. Um, uh, I guess may maybe uh, um, in my case, it would match my house um, and maybe for others, but, uh, but interesting. But um, I think we've talked a little bit about in the earlier slide about some of the confusions around uh, net pay deductions. And this goes along the thought about uh, language use for a customer uh, stroke uh, government point of view is backwards. And, uh, uh, and what are those obligations? And of course, we do have these differences with, with um, small employer differences on payments and various things. Um, then we've gone into other stranger things as well uh, in the, 
like the operation of the payroll ID. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, see a lot of documents um, still for HMRC forms refer to a works number or a payslip or an employee number, yet we have the payroll ID and RTI, and are they the same thing? Um, yeah, I think, uh, again, some of the other areas here is um, we are having HMRC presently issue instructions to employers where uh, there's an element of, well, I'm an, supposedly an expert in these fields, but even I don't know what to do with them because they don't seem to make any sense. Uh, we've talked about uh, the instructions on EYUs. They'll even tell you it's delta values. And that went four years ago. It doesn't apply. And don't specify individuals. Uh, yeah, it's an individual return. So how, how can someone make an adjustment to something you've not told them who it is to be adjusted from? And so those um, uh, things that an element and I guess the last comment there about where does the software come in uh, with HMRC support can be lacking I think we found even with the announcements from a software development support team point of view they'll tell us there's going to be a new field but no one's actually explained what the new field is for or what you do with it or where the value comes from and we've had that over a number of years with certain things. I think uh, thinking back three or four years, I can't remember what value it was specifically, but there was something they asked us that we had to start reporting. And there's an element of, um, well, what goes in there? And it says, well, we just want you to put it on the RTI FPS. And it sort of put what? It says, well, add the field in, it'd be fine. It's sort of, I can add a field in, but if I don't tell the customer what the value is that they're expected to populate, it'll be empty or zero. Uh, and it, it's sort of moving that. But I think we've gone a little bit to a world where the software change is defined as a field, uh, whereas a field is a result of a business process. So they need to describe the whole business process associated of what the field result is for. And the challenge I guess we've had over the past few things on um, these things, uh, I'll say to Karen, which is on some of the committees I'm on, uh, and is uh, uh, sort of tell us what problem you're trying to solve and we'll help you solve it rather than tell us how you're solving something but you don't tell us what the problem is you're solving because quite often when they actually explain to us what the problem is we we'll say well, you don't need that you need this I can easily give you that, but what you're asking for, uh, uh, sometimes I'll express it, Nick, it seems like sometimes they're asking us to swim across a shark infested uh, swimming pool. There's probably alligators and sharks in it, but they're insisting we have to dive into the pool when there's quite an adequate path around the side to the other end. And the goal is just to get to the other end. Why can't I just walk around? Uh, but they seem to insist on us having to dive into the water. Maybe they just don't like you very much, Simon. You know, that's their way of oh, yeah, killing you off. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Karen nodding throughout. And obviously you have to do this in, 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 in your experience. You've done this for multiple clients. So you must be very well versed in some of these stranger things. Uh, I wonder if you've got anything you'd like to add when you're trying to deal with these on behalf of clients. It must be quite challenging. Yeah, so with like payroll ID is, I think, quite a hot topic. Um, and indeed, um, through the CIPP, HMRC have, ed let's say, helped educate our profession and employers on what they're meaning by that, which is very helpful. However, in reality, the payroll ID employee number, the, there's Two or three schools of thought for me here is the first one is most software, and I will caveat that with most because obviously I'm not saying everyone, will automatically apply an ID. Um, so it be automated. There are, for whatever reasons, certain clients who will always want their own IDs. Um, not particularly keen on that because you you need relying on the client not to duplicate any of those IDs. Because if they do, of course, you've got two employees with the same ID that can cause issues. But the other thing is that software will automatically, on the whole, will automatically tick the box, the field, whatever it is in the, the, the software side, that says here is the old number, 
here is the new number. So I don't understand why HMRC has such a big problem with this myself. Um, they clearly seem to think there is, but the, it does cause duplicate employments. And that is one of the main reasons that HMRC use that, you know, you have got difficulties where um, clients change from one provider to another. Um, you're there, you've got clients who go from in-house to outsource, outsource back to in-house and perhaps use different software completely. Um, so there is in, you know, it's a bit like, you know, Simon, put, I love the analogy of the sharks and the crocodiles, you know, or the alligators going in there. But actually, it's what is it? What we know is that HRC needs to know it's gone from there to there. That, that's what they need to know. So it doesn't do a duplicate employment. Um, but why that seems to be happening, it, I must admit, it, I'm puzzled because software on the whole will do that. The other one that's on there is the P2P6. So what I was finding was, and actually this happened to myself, my tax code changed. I wasn't notified, not even on my personal tax account, can I just say, but my employer was. So my tax code was changed. I had no idea. And I'm actually, you know, sad, geek, whatever. I like to see what's going on in the PTA just because has something popped up that they've not shared that, that's good uh, or otherwise. And I was thinking, but even in the notifications in my PTA, now my tax code was right in it, but there was nothing to tell me they changed it. Um, so, of course, that then lends itself to queries, because what happens is the individual says, you why, is my, why is my pay different? And trust me, some of the payrolls used to, particularly in-house, uh, it could be pennies difference and the, the particular audience that we were paying would notice. Um, and, you know, it, it be like that and because you're trying to explain, so we've had a new tax code. Well, I didn't know about it. And then, you know, and then, of course, you unfortunately, you have to direct the individuals to HMRC. And none of us like to do that. Um, for obvious reasons, and I'll stop there with that. So there are, you know, and then as Simon said, you'll sometimes get a notification through that you think that's, that's manual, by the way. It's not coming through the portals that, you know, student loans and other things that you can automate now. Mm -hmm. And for any listeners who aren't automating, you, please, please look at your software because I'm sure there will be a way in which it can happen instead of you manually entering things like tax codes and student loans. That's another thing I've come across that everybody does that, um, is that you will get something random where, like Simon, you're like, what are they trying to tell me to do? I, I don't know. I don't know what. I don't even know what language this is. Um, you know, and you're thinking. And I quite often will reach out to like to Simon or Matthew and say, "Have I missed something?" Because that really stresses me out if I think I've missed something. And it's like, "Have I missed something here? What on earth have you come across this?" Um, same as the salary sacrifice thing we were talking about before. Getting that email, it was like, "Really? Have we got a new scheme introduced that I've missed?" And it's that kind of thing that you have these anomalies, these strange things that, that can happen. Thankfully, we have a community, not just us here on this panel. We have a massive payroll community where we can support each other to find out the answers. And of course, the Institute itself. Um, but yeah, strange things. And when the software, you know, thank goodness for our software colleagues. I will take my hat off to them. But HMRC do need to learn just because it can be a field doesn't mean that means it can work. Because as Simon says, it's a business process. If we need to put something in the field, it's got to come from somewhere. Um, and like to those hours, HMRC absolutely and genuinely, when you talk to them, convinced that we just hold this data. It's just there. And you're like, no, we don't. It could be in a time and attendance system. It could be in the HR system. It could be actually nowhere. It's just in a contract of employment that was forgotten years ago never been updated and yet they were convinced that it was dead easy so it's those things when it comes to the software it is amazing but government departments need to remember we've got to populate that software i think the beautiful thing i take away from that response is everyone watching or listening to this has probably experienced a stranger thing in one of those contexts and as you said it's a wonderful community and you are not alone that's the beauty right there's strength in numbers and strength just knowing you're not the only one experiencing these incidents can i come to you matthew not with this question though because obviously this is an audience show and i've had a few questions pop in the box i haven't had a chance to get to yet so i want to get to those now if we can um starting with that back to the salary sacrifice slide it said if you make a salary sacrifice and the benefits need pay rolling Oblig obligatory in the not so far future, then what's the point? Good question. I, I, I mean, at, at that point, if the if the tax position is equalised, whether you salary sacrifice it or don't, then yes, exactly. There is no real benefit to, to doing so. 
Um, whether that fits in with your business processes is is a completely different matter. You might want to put things through salary sacrifice for certain business reasons. I'm not entirely sure what those would be. Um, but yeah, pr predominantly salary sacrifice is, is used for things where you can gain a tax advantage from them because that's why you do sure. that. And historically, it was used for a lot more things because people were getting tax advantages from them until HMRC decided to turn around and go, you know what, don't really like this. Let's, uh, you can have it on these four things, but everything else is a no go. Um, so now we predominantly see it on the ultra low emission vehicles. You cycle to work if your company offers it, your pensions, and obviously you've got childcare vouchers, but that potentially won't be a thing for for many years into the future. Um, so we're looking at sort of narrowing it down really to three main things and the pension being the biggest one. Um, so yeah, it will just be a business decision as to whether you salary sacrifice or not, but it would usually be for those benefits, not anything else. Super. I'm coming to you, Karen. If you merge NI with tax, what about our pensioners? This is in relation to the poll. Well, pensioners don't pay NI anyway. So there's no NI on pension. Um, so it won't make any difference um, to them themselves. If you're referring to, I think Simon, uh, or was it Matthew alluded to this, if you scrap Social Security as we know it, part of the original thinking was that would go towards your state pension. And in reality, it's a bit like most local government schemes, to be frank, police, fire, the, the people paying in now are actually paying for the people who've retired. So you could argue if there is anything in that pot, we're, we're actually paying for people who are getting their pension now. Um, so if you're looking at that, then that indeed is going to be a question that would need to be answered in that. How do you show eligibility? Because, you know, at the moment, and this is why when David Gork really, he was very enthusiastic about it. And Simon, you will remember that he, he really, really wanted to explore it. He was an accountant by trade. Um, and when he looked at this, but it was the social security part that was actually going to prove the, the, the most cumbersome and difficult to actually undo for exactly that reason. In that, you know, they've already changed it to you've got to have 30 years. Obviously, it was different many years ago, what women used to have, have to have, what men used to have to have, and that's been equalized. Well, obviously, we know state pension age. Well, let's like, so should we all have a bet now? Maybe that should be a poll next time, Nick. At uh, what age will it be 90? What year will it become 90 before you get a state pension? But when you're looking at that, so I think that those questions would need to be answered if that was the angle that you were coming from. Um, and they would need to be answered. How how do you make sure that there's enough about, or indeed, you know, think outside the box. If you're going to scrap it, obviously it would have to be transition for all the people who have paid. If, but, you know, maybe, maybe that doesn't even apply. Maybe everybody gets a state pension regardless as long as they've done X, whatever X is in the future. You know, we've got, if you think about the generations that aren't even born, and I'm just thinking now, Matthew, with some of this stuff that you very kindly highlighted that you weren't even born, um, with some of the stuff we're talking about, you know, you've got generations that will come up that will, will radically change the way society um, deals with taxes and, and the future of pensions. Social care is the biggest, probably more, though, more so than state pension now. You know, who's going to look after you in old age? Um, so, Fantastic. Depending I'm on which, which way your question was. Yeah, no, super. You've given a really good comprehensive response, which is great. And Simon, last bit, just because you raised this, question comes in uh, from Janice. says, how do we make corrections now if EYUs no longer exist? So, uh, well, I say EYUs disappeared. In fact, they started going out in 2018, but eventually were withdrawn in 2020. So you couldn't do an EYU after April the 6th, 2020. Um, it's done by resubmitting the month 12 year to date position. No this time values, but the replacement of the year to date value for an individual. There are risks with that. It needs to have a late reporting reason associated with it. Um, it's, uh, there is a risk of duplicate because uh, even with the same payroll ID, HMRC occasionally treat it as another employment with the same payroll ID. Uh, and of course, you have other implications in your EPS because of course, uh, since the introduction of the app levy, if you're adjusting gross NI values, there may be an increased or reduced uh, app levy 
uh, value, which would then need to be adjusted on the EPS. So you can do it by EPS year to date adjustments. You can do that in basic PAYE tools, except it's limited to a maximum of 15. Uh, for for each instance installation. So if you've used your 15, you could scrap that, reinstall it, do another 15, scrap that, reinstall it, do another 15, that works, or do it on someone else's PC, that will allow you to do another 15. HMRC don't police it in any way, whereas the old EYU had no limit on it. Um, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's all a bit of a muddle, but uh, but equally, it's one of the things we specialise. Um, you know, my team, my personal team, we uh, can do FPS year to date uh, adjustments for people. The other aspect, though, is you're actually late. So if the taxation is more that you owe, there will be an interest charge because the payment should have been made by the 19th of April. So you're late on that adjusted payment. So, so it can still be done, but not via EYU. Super. Well, that's what I'm going to ask. If we can jump forward two slides, because we've got a, an event coming up relatively soon on the 5th of July. I want to make sure our audience are aware of it, and then we'll jump back if we've got time. Just want to bring the uh, the attention to the SD Works Academy. We've got uh, the SD Works are offering a number of courses coming up pretty pretty soon. First one is the 5th of July, Salary Sacrifice, What Is It and Why? 26th of July, there's Pensions and Payroll. 23rd of August, how clean is my payroll? 6th of September is holiday pay. 20th of September, the real living wage. Now, just to remind everybody, you don't have to be an SD Works uh, customer to sign up to the Academy if you want to follow one of the courses. Um, there, there is a full course calendar schedule at the link, which you can see on the slide. I can put that in the chat as well if people are interested in those. Uh, but Simon, I wonder if you can just give us a very brief overview of anything else that um, perhaps we can't see in the slide, but would give us some indication as to what might be beneficial for our audience to, to sign up to some of these. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess the other big subject, but it's something we warm up to towards the end of the year, so probably after September, but we can cover it before. The other beauty about the Academy, if people want these on demand, they can have them on demand if you want them for your organisation, as they act as like a consultation exercise. But of course, we've had the announcement that, uh, assuming that goes ahead and government doesn't change its mind, that payrolling benefits in kind will be compulsory in April 26. Well, a good time to start preparing is before. So, uh, and again, the deadline for report for requesting it is 5th of April 25. So if you want to start in 25, there's an element of we're coming to that time of year fairly soon where you'd need to prepare. So rolling after the September, there'll be a series of paralleling benefit in kind because we'll see a flurry of inquiries coming in saying, what is it? How do you do it? And I'm sure uh, the Institute will be experiencing that and other organisations because people are already asking, what are you doing about preparing for April 26? And there's an element of we've been offering payrolling services for about 25 years. Uh, Fantastic. And for those as well that want to get ahead of the payroll curve, if you're interested in the payroll podcast, there's a new edition out today. It's called The Future of Payroll Systems. Uh, so a subject close to Simon's heart. Um, so do check that out. And actually, the episode before that was uh, the last edition of Payroll Question Time. Where you can hear the last episode in audio only. If you did miss last month's, then you can still find out everything we discussed on that show. You can subscribe to it. It's on all the major podcast platforms, Spotify, uh, YouTube videos, if you want to see it live. Uh, Apple and more. So if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to that in the chat as well in just a moment. Right. I wonder if we can go back a slide now. We've got a little bit of time, maybe uh, not enough to get to this in detail. But we want to talk sure. about then and now reflections, previous trends and predictions. We've been doing the show for a long time now, Simon. I'd be interested to perhaps reflect on some of those predictions we made and see what's come to market, what hasn't. First uh, bullet point here is Bitcoin and crypto. I did a podcast on this on the show. Uh, talking about crypto, this is potentially coming in from the provider I spoke to, how in the future everyone will have more choice about how they want to be paid. Maybe they want it into digital wallets and crypto instead of, uh, you know, the, 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 the way that we are used to receiving our funds at the moment. So um, let me come to you here, Simon, just because perhaps you've been on the show with me longest and you and I probably made more predictions than most. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on some of the predictions we've made? Where are we now and what's still to come? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting area. It's something we'd really like to dive into and get to some more detail. But some predictions, not that many years ago, actually, 
but everything the a number of things were seen as this is the future we're all going to be gig workers we're all going to log into an app today to find out where we're working today um, where we've got to go and how many hours and what job and i think uh, and areas of these have actually increased but not to the extent they were predicted to and so it's all gone a bit quiet um to a certain extent but there's an element of going back some years if you talk 10 years ago i could have got lots of investment in exploring bitcoin uh etc yeah. but um does anybody talk about bitcoin really these days in payroll terms or is that just a little bit it doesn't really fit the model and i think there was a bcs article we'll say them member of the professional member of the british computer society did a thing about don't do something that doesn't fit do it if it does type thing and there's an element of a lot of these didn't really fit now has the gig economy uh grown i think zero hours is popular although it may soon be illegal uh, depending on results next week because uh, one certain party is going to get rid of them and uh, we've also had the protections that brought in even with the chap that uh, i met last week at the uh, awards um vince cable uh, brought in protections for zero hours on uh, uh, non-compete clause and things like that in his day when he was on the conservative liberal um uh, coalition government but i think it's it, sometimes we just have to sit back a bit when we predict what the future is and it would be good to do a benchmark of saying okay we think this is going to occur in five years did it uh, i mean an area i think that's gone a little bit quiet but i'm sure it will come around again and and uh, there are certain uh, areas is wage access you don't really hear as much of it uh, where are the, all the uh, people exhibiting and pushing it like they used to be it's gone a little bit quiet I, th I think they all have their place but not sometimes to the extent they're talked about a couple of observations from my side i agree with everything you've just said i think um i remember doing a podcast on the peril podcast with max van der Klisper sink i think it was 2018 and at the end of the show, I used to ask him, what would you like to see in the future? And he said, I would love to see interactive pay slips come in, but I don't think it'll ever happen in the next five to 10 years. And, you know, we are seeing that kind of technology now with a lot of systems offering interactive pay slips, helping people using AI to answer simple tax queries, reduce the burden on payroll departments. So I think that's something that was predicted on certainly on that show and something we've discussed here in the past. That's quite nice to see. I agree with you on the crypto Bitcoin piece. It hasn't taken off in the way that people potentially predicted. There was obviously a huge trend and everyone was buzzing about, you know, Bitcoin and this, that and the other. And it hasn't really taken off like, like it was predicted at the time. I think the one um, big shift that I'm starting to see now, and um, actually before I get into that, the interesting bit from a recruitment perspective is we're now talking about rolled up holiday pay, 12.07%. It's funny how the world goes full circle. When we first started this show, it was there, it got rid of it, it's come back. And it, I just find that whole thing interesting sometimes um, how things move in a cyclical fashion. But the rise of fractional workers, this obviously impacts work that we do and the lens that we look at. Specialists now coming from huge organizations with a wealth of experience, uh, making themselves accessible to small SMEs like ourselves who say, you know what, if you want to give our expertise and get our expertise, you don't have to employ us on a permanent basis. Have us for one day a month and we get the uh, you know, the, the, the experience in our in our business for someone who would usually be well out of our kind of remuneration range. So I think we're seeing a lot of those individuals now moving into fractional work. I don't see that slowing down at the moment. I think there's um, it's quite lucrative for those fractional workers. Work is now very much about work-life balance and flexibility. Of course, it gives those individuals that flexibility they need and that choice. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting market to, to observe. I don't know how that's going to impact the world of payroll necessarily. But certainly from a recruitment perspective, that's a shift we're seeing in the workforce. I think the other big shift, and it is relatively new. I mean, we came through the Great Resignation, 22, 20, 21, 22. 4.2 million people, I think, changed jobs in 21. 4.5, I think it was in 22 in the UK. Obviously, much bigger numbers in the US. Really changed the way that we looked at work. And I think that um, we've seen a big shift towards the employee experience from a payroll perspective and that integration and the importance between linking how we process our payrolls and how that impacts the employee from a mental health, financial health and, and an experience point of view. But also we've gone to a much more global based um, product suite, really, from a payroll perspective. A lot of payroll uh, people now processing payrolls globally. And we've seen the rise of EORs really disrupt the marketplace. I think two of them genuinely considered unicorns, zero to one billion pound valuation in less than a year. 
Um, and we're seeing those EORs really disrupt the market, POs come into the market. And we want, you know, as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of new technology unlock, as it says here, more global flexible employment systems. And I think that's a subject I anticipate we will be discussing in more detail at some point in the future, because I, it doesn't seem to be showing any signs of slowing down. Um, but I'd be open to Matthew or Karen to add any thoughts of maybe how you saw the market a few years ago and, and how you're seeing it now, any things you thought may happen that haven't. We've got, a, we've got a, maybe a minute just to run through. So maybe Karen, I'll come to you first and then I'll come to you, uh, Matthew. I'll be quick to give Matthew some time as well. A Bitcoin, a Bitcoin crypto scared the living daylights out of me because even now I still can't get my head around it. And Simon Blessing has tried his <laughs> hardest. Um, the gig zeros, fractional workers, what worries me is if the future government removes it because I don't think people should be exploited to protections, but it suits a lot of people. And as you've just said, particularly the fractional that might fall into this piecework type thing as well. So they're technology and definitely the global flex i can see us talking about that a lot i think that is the area tech in general ai i mean microsoft's now got its own and they're starting, they're starting to compete in the ai space um okay. that's the bit i see going forward and matthew yeah, I think with the sort of Bitcoin crypto, I think until we get something like the Britcoin that was proposed that sort of pegged with the actual currency, it's unlikely to have sort of any impact on payroll processes. I think in the past, Bitcoin crypto, it was one of those sort of buzzwords, I think like AI sort of is at the moment, although I agree with what Karen's just saying there, you're having a lot of big players in AI now actually competing and it seems to be a really transformative thing, not like sort of Bitcoin, which really in, in the grand scheme of things was a bit of a blip. Um, with regards to the gig economy, I think, uh, as Karen said, we don't want people to be exploited. And I think you've got the scope for a lot of companies using sort of almost the sort of blind spot in employment law to sort of get away with certain things that they potentially shouldn't be. So you've got that sort of the disassociation between are you an employee or are you self-employed and then if you're self-employed you don't necessarily get certain employee benefits and a lot of that sort of hinging around sort of um your sort of right to replace yourself uh, it's tending a substitute right of substitute um and i think that's sort of getting a little bit not out of hand but needs some sort of uh, hand over it uh, but yeah sort of agree with what simon and karen were saying there i think there's a uh, a lot of things, a lot of things changing, and yeah, it'd be good to see in five years' time what we think might happen and what actually does happen. Well, I think there's probably actually, scope here to, to reflect back on this again and maybe bring a poll in and ask our audience what they think might come in the future. So watch this space. Just like to say a huge thank you to our panel for joining us today on Payroll Question Time, Simon Parsons, Karen Thompson, and Matthew Quick, and of course to you for watching us and staying with us for slightly over time. Thank you for your patience. The next episode of Payroll Question Time will be on the 25th of July. Registrations will open soon at sdworks.co.uk forward slash PQT. Thanks once again, and we look forward to seeing you all in a month. Take care. Thank you very much. Today's episode of the Payroll Podcast has been sponsored by Deal, the all-in-one global people platform that simplifies how you pay your global teams. Deal's fully managed global payroll makes it possible to pay your entire team in over 100 countries and in over 200 currencies all in one place. So whether you're an enterprise business, a small company or something in between, Deal is built to meet your unique business needs. With in-house customer success managers, local payroll experts, dedicated points of contact and more, Deal's fully managed global payroll eliminates third-party handovers and it provides unmatched compliance and flexibility. In fact, they'll even help you track and flag the latest changes to payroll regulations before they even become an issue. And with 24-7 monitoring and best-in-class security protocols, your sensitive data is always protected. So are you ready to transform your global payroll system? If you are, click the link in the show notes and book your demo with Deal today.